So hi, everybody. Let me go ahead and label the poll and we can get into our content for the day. So hi, everyone. This is T. Falcon Napier. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today, we're going to continue our discussion on the American values as proposed by L.R. Cole in 1988. So we are now up to number eight. And uh, before we get into the meat of what future orientation is all about, I just want to bring something to your guys' attention that we mentioned last time around, but it ended up creating some dialogue that I wanted to share with you, with you all. Um, and that is, why don't values plot on the change grid? So why did we say that when you are living your values, you're inside of your green circle? So how come values don't plot on the change grid? And so this is my answer to that. The change grid is a map of adjectives. So anything that's used to describe somebody's behavior, thoughts, whatever, I can certainly put on here as long as it's in an adjective form. When you think about someone's values, values are by and large considered to be nouns, although technically they would be nominalizations. Do you guys know the test for the difference between a noun and a nominalization? So can you touch it. Uh, that's good. That's actually really good. I was taught, can you put it in a wheelbarrow? So if you can't put it in a wheelbarrow, then it's, is it really a noun or is it a nominalization? A nominalization is when you treat a process as though it were a thing. So, um, you know, if we said something like, in fact, I wanted to bring up because of this one, when we say future orientation, well, future orientation is a noun. That's what they want. I guess that's what it'd say, but it's a nominalization. I can't put future orientation into a wheelbarrow. You can't touch it uh, to, to Daniel's test. There's That means there is a series of, of verbs that are involved in doing this. This is an action that we have come to label as future orientation. And um, so sometimes I can plot those actions on the change grid, but not in the way we would plot an adjective, but instead the way we go about plotting ideal locations. So for example, if someone said that, okay, future orientation, I might as well read this to you guys soon. Or like, oh, by the way, um, I would imagine you all have it, but just in case, let me just chat it over to everybody. There you go. It's in the chat window. Um, so future orientation, valuing the future and the improvements Americans are sure the future will inevitably bring means that they devalue the past and are to a large extent unconscious of the present. There's a lot in that sentence. Mm -hmm. Even a happy present goes largely unnoticed because happy as it may be, Americans have traditionally been hopeful that the future would bring even greater happiness. Almost all energy is directed towards realizing that better future. At best, the present condition is seen as preparatory to a later and greater event, which will eventually culminate in something even more worthwhile. Okay, so there's a lot right there, but there's two paragraphs to go. So um, as I as I kind of was thinking about this and looking at it, I went like, you know, if we really wanted to do the best job of what that paragraph has just described, there's a certain place on the change grid that's going to support that. So because that is actually, I imagine I could break it into a dozen activities as far as that one paragraph is concerned. But nevertheless, because this is a set of activities, we know that every activity uh, is going to have a current location on the change grid and a most desirable location on the change grid. And what makes its location desirable is that at certain places on the change grid, certain activities occur more naturally. And so if I really want to, what was one of the things that it said? I wanted to, happy to meet, uh, if I wanted to be hopeful that the future would bring even greater happiness, no, we'll go next. I'm directing my energy towards realizing a better future. So just use that as a plottable activity, directing all energy toward realizing a better future. Okay, that's a plottable activity. Where on the change grid do you think you would do the best job of, what were those words again? Sorry, I'm flicking back and forth. Directing energy towards realizing a better future. Tis better to hope than receive. 
tis better to open. Very often that's the case. My life has been plagued with disappointment. So, uh, but think about that. If you were really going to be directing energy towards that more, you know, desirable outcome, however they phrased it, where on the change grid do you do the best job of directing energy towards a future outcome? Moving out. The cursor is right now. Be, driven, uh, driven, driven expressive. More, the expressive driver or driven expressive either way right there is where it's going to actually yeah. start happening depending on what's motivating it maybe it's going to start with a little bit more expressive energy and then uh turn us into someone who's trying to make something happen or maybe we have a, a little bit more ability and confidence in which case we're now an expressive driver primarily a driver but with this expressive kind of element thrown in there um now, uh, we'll talk about other locations as well, but just to, to build the case for this particular location, these two little sub-quadrants right here, what we're talking about. If you were to look at the adjective map, this is where people are very persuasive, influential. This is where they, they flirt and they romance and they're smooth and all those kinds of, of uh, adjectives that describe someone who is very much trying to make a particular outcome happen, but they don't feel like they've got all the ability necessary to build the analytical <clears throat> case for it or prove their point. So they instead need to endear themselves a little bit more. They need to, you know, put the spotlight on you. So it's all that romancing the deal or winning the audience over to your way of thinking, whatever. You guys get the, the, the vibe of this energy that's happening here? Yeah. Four point. And keep in mind, those are two of the four quadrants we identified as being the, the realm of emotional intelligence. And so it's rather intelligent for you to be able to turn on the charm and personality and be engaging and persuasive um, when you can't build the analytical case. And maybe just maybe that's a better way to go about doing it is to schmooze it rather than to prove it. So um, so I could definitely see that that energy would be directed towards a better outcome. Where else might uh, I plot to be uh, to do a more effective job at managing energy? How are was phrased? Managing energy towards a directing. Effect. What's that? It said directing. So I was just thinking like the directing of it means like you're actually participating in the shaping of it. Yeah. So the, the visioning, however, I think that would start in the green circle and then you kind of move outwardly to actually, you know, yeah. get other people involved or start gathering resources, whatever that kind of thing is. Yeah, so I'll, I'll agree with that. Directing. With, yeah, I'll agree with that with just one caveat. I think there's a lot of people that are more outgrid that are out there doing things and making all kinds of changes and all sorts of things that uh, didn't come to it from that thoughtful place first. They more kind of like just jumped in and did it, you know? So I think you're right, the best uh, chances of reaching a desired outcome is to start off with that, uh, you know, centered place where you can see everything, understand everything. And then you're going to get a little bit more um, uh, intentional about it. So that's this little slice right here. And then that intention is going to uh, give way to the engagement that needs to be done to make it all happen. So you're in the very much sweet spot. But I just wanted to throw out there that there is a caveat, uh, caveat that there are people who just jump out there. Maybe it's impulsive. I tend to think of impulsivity as being more a reflection of someone's level of productive tension. But I can also see how maybe impulsive isn't the right word. But if you're so driven towards a particular outcome, um, you're not necessarily doing things impulsively. Maybe you're doing things instinctually more or you're doing things more... Um, deliberately so now well, that's, yeah, I, 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 i'm kind of out there intuitively myself. I, I do things to like learn by doing and so like when i want to understand something that i'm envisioning yeah I, I create i don't call it a goal i literally call it a project and i go out and design something so that i can okay. figure out what's working what isn't harvard yeah. even coined this term these professors wrote in the Harvard Business Review from, uh, they call it smart talk. Yep. They said a lot of times with organizations, why they fail is because they think with all of these meetings they're having, that the talking itself kind of replaces action. And so nothing never gets done. 
and they advocate this idea of you learn by doing you you learn yeah. to actually teach yourself and and encourage yourself empower responsibility uh, that's right well that and person. some have certainly said that learning doesn't occur until behavior changes right exactly and so we have to it, it implies that some sort sort of changes actually occurring there i guess i'm thinking about something a little bit more sinister and so maybe i need to be in the outgrade danger zone to really illustrate my point these are people out here that might be taking um need reactions to things someone said it might be instinctual but i think the instinct is being clouded by narcissism or by uh, what this heavy dopamine that's going on this holier than thou kind of thing so in that case they didn't start off in the green circle they just kind of are, are out here yeah so just did it just jump yeah, in the cold, cold water well this is it i think they did <laughs> If we uh, if we look at the change grid a bit like uh, the structure of what, what is it an, an atom, yep, right that you've got the nucleus in the center, yep, and then you've got uh, 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 power shells, if yep. you will, yep. right where the quantum yep. leaps take place. Uh, I think someone uh, can very easily be in the center, yep. and uh, a remark can launch them. <laughs> you know, oh a couple, yeah, a couple yeah. Of, uh, and of and keep in mind to to Daniel's observation um, a couple of sessions ago when he posed that uh, uh, that the chain grid could take the form of a torus. Mm -hmm. Right behind this purple spot are all four of these red ones. Mm -hmm. You just have to right. think of it as being shaped like a, a donut, three dimensional, a kind of a donut sort of a thing, and these wrapped around till they're on the back side of this whole sort of thing. So it could be very well, very. It's a very short trip between um, the center of the change grid and the extremes in the danger zones based on Daniel's um, Daniel's theory there. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So neighbors, call, yeah, instant movements. <laughs> and by the way, change grid or no change grid, the brain can certainly have us change our attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, thoughts, whatever, mm -hmm. in micro milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Which, which is why this is so much more important to understand than, than the simplicity of of, um, of of personalities. Yeah, 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 yep. You know, it's certainly true. Anytime someone's trying to divide human behavior into a relative handful of possibilities, well, you know, you're going to get some glimpses and those are going to be interesting and kind of a nice form of edutainment and all that. But that doesn't give, I think, professionals the depth that they uh, really benefit from having and I think have a hunger for. Because I don't know a professional in human development who would ever say that anybody is 100% any one of the personality types in any model you want to pick out. You know, we've all got uh, the ability to become what the situation at hand requires. That may very well mean that we have to, at least in that moment, behave in an out of type kind of way, but we can still do it. Um, it'll take its toll on us for sure. We'll be exhausted, maybe, or whatever. I mean, I'm more of a downgrade person. That's why I'm flooding her around down here. So yeah, I can get out there and be an outgrade person. Um, I can be a very ingrid kind of amiable sort of type, but it's not my nature. So can I do it? Yeah. Or I can be in front of an audience uh, and do it 25,000 plus hours of time. And I did. That's an upgrade, outgrade behavior. That is not mm -hmm. me, but that's something that I can certainly do. And I think I did rather well, but it takes its toll. Okay. Uh, but you have, you have what it's all about when you're in that environment. See, well, you have control. Right. And that's what it is. You rise to the occasion, you do whatever it is that really needs to be done. And then you go back to wherever home is for you. I mean, some people, you know, can't wait to get up on that stage. Um, and for me, it was always just part of what needs to be done. You know, so it's right. a very different thing. So, well, now Edie's a professional speaker. Edie, if you want to unmute for a second, I know Edie loves being up on stage. <laughs> So I've never. Well, I, yeah, listen, in the la in my last TED talk, I stopped in the middle and I put my hands to the gods in the sky and said, 
I am flooded with dopamine. It happens every time I'm on stage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I get up on stage begrudgingly, but nevertheless, <laughs> I'm there. It's showtime. The show must go on. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think that they confuse the uh, ideals uh, or concepts of introvert and extrovert. So it doesn't mean like to your point that an introvert can't do these extrovert things, but right. it just means like that's not where you Get, you get your energy get your energy there yep 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 to recharge your batteries i need to move inward inward so that's why i always found it difficult when if it's a smaller kind of a client you guys you know you, you guys all do the kind of work i'm talking about you know the client will invite you out to dinner or something like that and in my head i'm kind of like oh please don't <laughs> yeah i hated that i just I'm the same way <laughs> It's like when I come from a talk and people like ask questions, I'm like, I just want to go somewhere, retreat. I don't want to be bothered. Like I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. And even at the end of a talk, if you know, all the applause and the accolades and all that, I mean, I certainly appreciate it, but I prefer that what they're really celebrating at the end of the presentation is the knowledge that they gained. It's not about me. It's right. about material. <laughs> if, and so I want to have a contract in hand. Yeah. And then all all that you stand to gain is probably nothing <laughs> except no, a meal. Yeah, no, there it is. There it is. There it is. Okay, anyway, so I just wanted to throw this out to say that I think a lot of these values could be translated into activities, specific practices that uh, lead to that value or an integral part of that particular value. Those we can plot, but the value itself to me is something that is unique to the individual, and we bring it with us everywhere we go. And so for us to feel most at peace, most comfortable, it's about living in congruence with our values and the environment being such a way that it is supporting those values. I think you need both those things. I've got to be out there living it, but I also need an environment that allows me to live it. And so if I've got both that environment and I've got my values and everything's right, I'm in the green circle. I'm in the green circle. Um, I can certainly look at general values and say sometimes values are more outgrid. So, um, and maybe that's what we're really talking about is that when it comes to American values in general, would you say that American values tend to be more um, outgrid, upgrid, ingrid, or downgrid oriented? Outgrid? more outgrid. I mean, we're, uh, we really are, um, uh, hold a lot of values that are about doing things, accomplishing things. And we've already talked about some of these things in here, this idea about, we like to plan ahead. We like to uh, make things happen that haven't happened before. We like to at least think we can control the environment without destroying the planet. No one thought about that part. Um, and then, um, yeah, um, you know, th this is all part of it, I think there. Now, we could probably find one or two that are a little more specific, uh, but I think the overall energy of the American experience, but there, I just gave you what sounds like a noun, but it isn't a noun, it's a nominalization. The American experience isn't a thing, it's a set of activities, behaviors, verbs. Um, that come into play. And again, those we can actually explore um, on that. Yeah. So where's yeah. the innovation? The thing is, that's what America is known for, too. Okay, uh, let's take a look at that one. Then, Daniel, hold your thought. Don't, don't lose your thought. But innovation, everyone, where does innovation live on the change grid? Is it more upgrid, outgrid, downgrid, ingrid? Well, that, that sounds outgrid to me. Sounds outgrid? It's, mm. it's expressive, expressive yeah. outgrid, you know, up. Yeah, right about there. Yep, yep, yep. And this is where, if you look at things, this is where creative problem solving lives. Remember, the true artistic creativity is more downgrid. But when you're using problem solving skills, uh, trying to um, maybe create something that would lead to a new opportunity, so any kind of research and development with the emphasis placed on the expectation that development will occur because we don't just research, we make our money when something gets developed because of our research. So uh, you get the idea, that's this energy right here. And you can see because it, it's on the, the border, well, well, I'll just say it involves both the 
analytical expressive. Now, the analytical mm -hmm. expressive is someone who has an idea um, and that idea, that, uh, that, that, that feeling that something isn't quite as it could be, should be. There's no threat. They're not up in stress. But they kind of see that there's a, a missing piece or an opportunity, a puzzle that needs to be sort of solved. Um, that's what this is. In fact, if you guys ever go to one of those, um, what are they called? Not the mystery rooms, challenge rooms. What are they called where you're trying to break out of the room? Escape rooms. Escape rooms. A good escape room should put you right here on the change grid. You know, it's it's stressful enough or exciting enough that you're engaged in doing that. Um, you're aware of what's going on, but it's stimulating your analytical skills in that problem solving kind of mode. And then I think that uh, uh, to I think it was Kathy who mentioned it might also uh, lean a little bit outgrade here at a certain point in time, you do have to say that problems that problem once hmm. Once we realize how to solve the problem, we need to solve the problem. Yeah. And so there's still work to be done even after the, 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 the figuring is over, we, we need to do that. And here we now have an amiable driver energy, which would be more about mobilizing people, resources, et cetera. Again, uh, the operations, world of operations lives in that amiable driver uh, kind of subquadrant. So that I think is where innovation actually comes from, whether the innovation is being driven by a known problem or the innovation is being driven just out of the joy of innovating. Um, as long as it produces something, then I think we're, we've described the right, uh, the right place on the change grid for that. Do any of you think that the, I don't know what the rest of the value that uh, Coles talk about, but as a value, do you think America's losing that aspect? to, you know, China, India, uh, and a mm -hmm. lot of other immigrants no. that used to come here to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to the States to uh, learn sciences and those kinds of things. But now they're staying home. So there's talk about is America losing its innovation edge? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> That's my, my humble opinion is no, because the cultures you're describing don't have innovation as part of their long their long history. Yeah, lots of great things were created over time, but that drive to innovate as opposed to the drive to duplicate. Mm. So, That's why there's so much intellectual stealing of American oh, innovation right. from those That's countries. Right. Yeah. That's right. Well, and a great deal of American innovation is from people who came from those countries. Well, it could very well be because, you know, I do believe that, you, you know, all kinds of people exist everywhere in the world. <laughs> so if they went like, hey, you know, my my usual way I like to use my brain and the kind of work I like to do, et cetera, it doesn't really match the culture that I was born into. So maybe I need to, um, you know, migrate a little bit, and see where I can find my people. Right, uh, right. Yeah. And so um, now one other thing. Um, to bring up about this. Wait, I just lost my thought. Mm, it'll come back anyway. Um, these other two, by, by the way, this is also emotional intelligence, these two subquadrants, uh, where we are able to address an issue. This is where resilience lives. So mm -hmm. lots of good things happen at this particular place along the Oh, I remember what I was going to say. Uh, the Japanese, and I, it might be go back 30, 40 years, I really don't, don't know the time frames, but they seem to be exceptional at miniaturizing things. Mm -hmm. So that, in fact, I think there was probably where like anything that the U.S. can create, um, Jap Japan can make it smaller and smaller and whatever. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that's so much innovation as much as it is. Uh, an innovative approach to improving a current, uh, you know, current technology or whatever, but. Right. Yeah. But. Yeah, yeah. In this discussion, I, I, I started to say earlier and I wanted to bring back to it. Um, I'm looking at the green circle. Yep. And the, um, and the, uh, the array coming out of it, right. Mm -hmm. Across the, yep. the purple array. Yep. Uh, yep. And, and seeing those, those, um, Quarter sections uh, outside of the purple, inside of the green. Yep. Right, and just wondering what what name might go to those. You you made some statements uh, as you were talking uh, that I, I that captured my attention, 
And um, I just jotted down that the top maybe is sensing. Uh, the the right you you named mobilizing, okay. Um, and and I just wonder is is the bottom one doing and uh, the 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 ingrid waiting? Well, I think that's very interesting to to look into because obviously the uh, the the waiting part that's a, a driven amiable they have less driver energy than an amiable driver. So if anything, the doing is going to uh, happen We're along planning. the heart line as we move from in-grid to out-grid. Mm -hmm. That I think for sure. I also think that doing is more likely to happen up-grid than down-grid, but uh, there's a price to be paid along this, this uh, um, little spectrum. I think that uh, obviously people that are down-grid have a higher ability. So I'd like to think that there is stronger accuracy here than there may be okay. up here. Something like that. But I don't really know that I've ever labeled any of those. I do know that I could look at these wedges and tell you what those wedges are labeled as being. Mm -hmm. um, and that might give us a little bit more of a glimpse into it. I just need to scroll through here and find my wedges. That's uh, an interesting uh, insight there, Daniel. Yeah, my brain just kind of runs around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you divide into the eight personality types. There then, we go. The area we're talking about would be an influencer. Up here would be the energizer. But again, if you want to stay confined to the to the green there. circle, these have to be really, oh, I don't want to say, um, contained. Mm. So there is a sense of energy here as opposed to being an energizer bunny mm. up here. And there is an attempt here to gently influence as opposed to hit them with the pitch kind of thing you know so encourage versus get out there and tell them what to do so as we work our way around i think some of these words might help us get a, a little better idea about what's happening in a particular location that's why it's really good and again going back to our discussion about chat gpt before we began the official call right now i've got chat gpt ready to read someone's change grid, any one of the 144 locations, uh, that's not true, 169 locations, um, uh, it can read it, but only three layers of the change grid. If I try to add another layer of it, it's too much for its buffers to handle. I need it to be able to handle at least eight layers because- But do you, you? What's that? But do you? I mean, you know, if it handles three layers and those three layers could be, if that could be put into an app, yeah. Um, then, you know, yes, more is better, but that's a great start. Well, it is a great start, but here's where my personality comes into play. Um, no, for me, it would be like, it's got to do all of it. <laughs> so, so that's my, that's my, I don't know what value that is. It might just be that I have this like little twisted kind of way of going things, but because honestly, I think you guys realize that if I wanted to be like most people that developed anything out there, I could have just done these two layers and, and been done with my whole career. Just said, you take these two perceptions, challenge and ability, looking at an activity and, oh, look, you're up in stress. But you need to have some intensity uh, to know what's going on to all that. You're at fifth degree intensity and power stress. Oh my gosh. If all I had done was created a book just around this, this combination of two layers, um, I could have probably outperformed, but it never interested me. And to this day, it doesn't interest me. The only thing that interests me is how I can combine as many models as possible into a single model. Uh, because that to me is what the world needs to unify all this brilliance that have come from so many people across so many uh, slices of life that I get excited about. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's true. We could really just do three layers and sell the thing. <laughs> so, uh, I love As that. an introduction. Yeah, yeah, I could. I don't know. Could you tell the enthusiasm in my voice? <laughs> so. yeah, hear the shift. But Definitely. it's not it's not something that you would do. Yeah, but not something I would do, but work. I believe. Yeah, someone who feels right. so inclined. Yeah, they could do something pretty remarkable. 
Yeah. Oh, Shag's chat over here. As I recall, a position on the grid requires a, a gerund. It could be in the gerund form, uh, which would be uh, for everyone ending ing. I always say that when you're creating a change works profile and making your activity list, you have a choice. Um, do you want the um, the activity phrased in such a way that it feels like a continuing process, like managing my energy? Uh, as opposed to an event, manage my energy. Mm. Uh, so is it a static kind of a thing or do you want to leave the dynamic? The change grid can be used effectively in both cases. My warning to all of you as a best practice is don't mix your list up. If you're going to be inging at the beginning, you make sure you're inging all the way to the end. So make them all gerunds or make them all not gerunds, just plain old present tense, uh, present tense verbs. Um, okay, uh, all right, now that we are, let's take a look at the rest of what Cole was writing here. No, I don't need the tools. So uh, now, since Americans have been taught to believe that man and not fate can and should be the one who controls the environment, <laughs> this has made them very good at planning and executing short-term projects, more like short-sighted. Um, this ability, in turn, has caused Americans to be invited to all corners of the earth to plan and achieve the miracles that their goal setting can produce. If you come from a culture where talking about or actively planning the future is felt to be a futile, perhaps even sinful activity, you will have not only philosophical problems with this very American characteristic, but religious objections as well. Yet it is something you will have to learn to live with while you are here. For all around you, Americans will be looking toward the future and what it will bring. Okay. So thoughts about this particular value? Do you believe this continues to this very day? Has, has any of this changed? What do you guys think? I mean, I, I think the future orientation will always be there. I mean, I, I, I've never liked using this Coles model because it's just so outdated yeah. um, in its language and its notions about, you know, the role that America plays, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but I think that future focus is, I mean, that's part of em the eminent domain concept. That's part of you know ex exploration innovation all of those things so i i don't I, I don't think that's going away i think how we operationalize it is not always well right, right. effective but i think as a value it's there yeah yep, yep 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 this one still seems to be there obviously it has its problems built into it and so and by the way i did find uh recently another set of american values that is a little bit more updated has some very different values on it many of these still appear but it has a bunch of extra ones as well so i thought it's uh, kind of fun to look at how things were 35 years ago so that we can kind of appreciate some movement up the spiral has actually happened <laughs> so uh, all right, so let's look at number nine here, action, work, orientation. Don't just stand there, goes a typical bit of American advice, do something. This expression is normally used in a crisis situation, mm -hmm. yet in a sense, it describes most Americans' entire waking life, where action, any action, is seen to be superior to inaction. Mm -hmm. Americans routinely plan and schedule an extremely active day, any relaxation must be limited in time, pre-planned, and aimed at recreating, as in the word recreation, recreation, their ability to work harder and more productively once the recreation is over. Americans believe leisure activities should assume a relatively small portion of one's total life. People think that it is sinful to waste one's time to sit around doing nothing or just to daydream. Such a no-nonsense attitude toward life has created many people who have come to be known as workaholics, or people who are addicted to their work, who think constantly about their jobs, and who are frustrated if they are kept away from them, even during their evening hours and weekends. When such a person finally takes time away from work to go on vacation, even the vacation will be carefully planned, very busy, and active. 
Um, the workaholic syndrome in turn causes Americans to identify themselves wholly with their professions. The first question an American will generally ask another American when meeting them for the first time is related to his or her work. What do you do? Where do you work? What company are you with? America may be one of the few countries in the world where it seems reasonable to speak about the dignity of human labor, meaning that hard physical by that hard physical labor. In America, even presidents of corporations will engage in physical labor from time to time, and in doing so, gain rather than lose respect from others for such action. Mm. Well, that last paragraph, I think it's more about photo opportunities these days, but uh, yeah. And it also yeah. might be that most CEOs, particularly in the high tech world, mm -hmm. don't possess the knowledge and skills to step in and do the actual work of the company. No, right? that's, you know? that's often missing. Yeah, it's just beyond their 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 world. Um, okay, so do we still have an uh, action work orientation? Do yes, still... and yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We are now being observed. By... I mean, this that this one here is there, there's a high cost for this one that's filling up emergency rooms, uh, stress, well being, the whole deal. This this attitude here. Not that it's wrong. It's just that it's 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 practice in extreme. And I remember like actually interviewing sixty nine, uh, we call them highly leveraged professionals about uh, productivity and like if they have an extra ten or fifteen minutes, like what do they do? So these are other physicians, lawyers, entrepreneurs. I say, oh, you have to feel it. You have to be productive. You got to be doing something. But yet they're suffering from all these, you know, metabolic, uh, non-communicable lifestyle conditions. And it's sad to see it. Like even their vacation to that point is just like, yeah, I have to go back to the grind. Like, why is it a grind? And why go back? You know, so we create these, these conceptions where this idea of, uh, work like you 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 get an escape clause somewhere in the in the distant future that you call retirement it's just not a healthy model at all yet look where it's brought us both good and bad it <laughs> seems to have led us to where we are and in many ways the, my, my thought really of, about this particular one is that it resonates with certain personality types and mm. it certainly doesn't resonate with other personality types that are, you know, both in the same country. So when I think about action work orientation, it seems to be like a natural fit for the driver personality types or the high D types or whatever word you want to use for that outgrid personality. Um, I get that. And maybe if it's more of an intellectual uh, process, maybe some of the more downgrid you know, the driven analyticals, even there though, there's that driven energy that's coming into play. Or even if you go upgrade and look at the driven um, expressive, you know, they're the ones that are creating the parties. They're the ones that are creating the excitement and all that. So I can see where all that driver energy is something that really is celebrated. And if that is a natural match for your personality, well, then you read this and kind of go, well, this makes complete and total sense. I don't, I yeah. don't see the problem. I wonder where does demographics fit into this as well? Mm -hmm. Because I'm just thinking like, I think it was last that I read 35% of the American workforce in particular are millennial. And they don't have the same uh, work ethic, I guess you can call it, like the baby boomers, you know, who work for an organization for 30, 40 years, retire with gold watch and pension. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the research shows they'll stay. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, but the other, the other thing of that is that that same generation you're describing it, it also suffers from this inability to do nothing. Because even when they say they're doing nothing, why do I suspect they have a device in front of them where they're typing feverishly? Yeah, it's a different type of doing nothing. It's, it's um, you know, I mean, what, what Brian was stating, what this brings to mind is the people, most cultures have, this is the hardest, one of the hardest values to connect with when they come here, um, the nonstop nature of it. 
um, just because, but at the same time, Far Eastern cultures, Koreans, Chinese, many Holy Japanese God. fit right in beautifully because they share this. So right. that's another component of, of, a, of a cultural component. But I, I think demographically, if you look at it, kids are very, very rarely doing nothing as, as we were saying, they're, they're just doing it. They're doing different things. Right. right, right. But you know, they're, they're doing different things and they're doing things, I believe, for different reasons. Yeah. And they're doing things that they want to do yep. versus right. the things that they're being told to do, ordered to do, required to do. Which is a demographic difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yep. 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 It's also different places on the change grid. Again, remember, change is either going to be dictated by external factors, internal factors, or since we've been talking about it in the middle there, you could fi find a blend of those factors that could be impacting the change process. And so to Daniel's point, if something is something they have to do, they're being forced to do it. That's more of an upgrade kind of a thing where um, if you are describing someone who is very intentional, deliberate, self-managing, self-directing, then that's obviously more on the outgrid energy side of things. But in either, you know, both of those cases, we really don't celebrate people that are downgrid. We really don't celebrate people that are in grid because these people in grid, we want them to step up to the plate, find your courage, take your chance, get out of here. You know, we kind of look down on the hesitant. Uh, and down here, we look, we definitely look down on the lazy. Um, but being downgrade doesn't necessarily mean lazy, maybe down here in the danger zone, yeah, but just because someone isn't physically active doesn't mean their brain isn't going a mile a minute. It actually yeah. probably goes, a mile a minute would be pretty slow for the brain. It's, it? it, it's interesting that you say that, Tila, because I, I was just wondering uh, about your thoughts on on the, uh, the recent uh, advances by unionism mm -hmm. in, in exactly those two quadrants. Well, I mean, if we think about this, what is the union, um, what does union marketing promise um, new members and existing members? Better benefits. Yeah, well, the benefits are things like we take care of the timid. So, you know, if we fight what you're unwilling to kind of do, and we take care of details you don't want to be bothered with. So I think that they really are marketing themselves. Well, if it's a brand new unionization attempt, they may very well be marketing themselves more with an upgrade and even an outgrid energy. So look at all the terrible stuff that they're doing to you and well, oh, blah, blah, blah. And they're trying to awaken that anger and that kind of thing and maybe direct it into a little bit of an army that is at least going to be recruiting people to come to the union presentations and to get out there. So this is how a new... Uh, business gets unionized, but what right. they ultimately promise to stay in place is we take care of these people. So you don't get abused. You don't get taken advantage of, you know? So, yeah. yeah. There's a battle <laughs> going, back going on now with the whole hybrid thing and organizations that are forcing people to come back to work. And so some are claiming different disabilities and that kind of thing. And so you oh, have attorneys yeah. and unions latching on to this idea that why people can't go back to the office. Right, 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 right. Yeah. It, it would be interesting to look at where on the change grid they were when they were in the office and where they were on the change grid doing the same job ostensibly, yep. uh, but not in the office. And yep. what is the dynamic tension between that? Yeah, and obviously it's also kind of job specific. I do understand that certain jobs uh, benefit from being physically together, but I don't need to be physically together to do to, to do a great many things. You know, if I'm if I'm an engineer and I'm working on a prototype of some thing, I would imagine I need to be where that thing is. And if I can get other people who are also working on the thing together in front of the thing, you know, it just makes sense. We need to get together. But yeah. managing people, I think I can do that remotely quite effectively. You know, one of the things of what you were saying about unions and so forth, I mean, it really is pro promoting 
mediocrity yes. and dependency and dependency leads to depression. Mm -hmm. And I think of, you know, Eric Weinmayer, the blind guy that climbs Mount Everest. And he said, you know, it's not about the view. It's the process of becoming more than you ever thought possible. So when I look at human potential, to be lazy is not, we need to challenge ourselves to, you know, be more alive and, and more excited. Right. Just, you know what I mean? Actualizing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so all of this kind of minimizes that. Anyway. No, you're absolutely you know, right. Because think yeah. about when unions first formed, what was the world of, of business like? in the United States and everywhere else you were being formed. There were very dangerous jobs where mm -hmm. they were even having kids do sorts of things and they were working ridiculous hours under horrible conditions. It's like, yeah, somebody needed to step in and say, look, you got to treat people better. You got to do whatever it is. So I understand how and why unions first came to be. But over the course of time, um, you know, decades, plus I'm sure it's over a hundred years now, um, they kind of realized that um, the union was first and foremost a business. Yeah. And as a business, it needed customers. And to have customers, it needs to be able to promise the delivery of some sort of a service that those customers either cannot uh, or will not or, uh, you know, do for themselves. So, you know, you could bargain individually, but collective bargaining is going to help more people more easily. So pay us and we'll do the bargaining for you. And so it's become a business. And as a business, it, to Edie's point, of course, I need as the, the manipulative part of that business, I need to make sure that my existing members continue to delegate to me the authority to do what needs to be done on them. And to grow the business, I need to find other organizations where I can, uh, where if they aren't already disgruntled, I can help them to become disgruntled. Mm. Yeah, and that's going to build all that. So I, I don't want to say unions don't have any value. They certainly do. But I wonder if the value they have today um, is even in the same league as where they first were created. And by the way, I'm sure there's places in the world that still have terrible work conditions and people doing jobs they shouldn't be doing and owners that couldn't care less what happens to them. So in those particular countries, yeah, it's time for a union to step in and, and help uh, who needs to be helped. But you just kind of wonder, um, you'll be, you know, they, that's well, my- In most of those countries, they don't need a union because the government has control over all of that. Yeah, right. And so uh, they can't do it anymore. So they need a beneficent government. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep, yep. Well, their union becomes another government. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Um, okay, uh, so uh, going back to this one, and this will take us to the top of the hour. Uh, do we believe this is still part of, um, of American culture? Work, work, work? Yeah, I'll be interested in hearing uh, your guys' opinion. <laughs> Less, I, less, I, less go, less go. I, more play, more play, less work. Yeah, I think it's still an underlying value and that I think people really judge other people who don't work or who don't, you know, so I think there's that piece of it, but it's certainly not what it was as the, you know, as technology takes over, as baby boomers start mm -hmm. retiring, dying off, et cetera. Um, it's a it's a shift. It's a big shift. It's a big shift. A shift in which way do you think it's going? For the works or better? It's a, away from the the workaholism. Although you know, I wonder. Yeah, I think, and I think things like COVID shifted that as well. That's right. In a big way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a and way you that starting, you are starting to see more. Um, more liberal parental, um, um, oh, what do they call it when the baby's born? Maternal, maternity leave and paternity leave. You're seeing that start to uh, become more, more prevalent. Um, but I can certainly tell you for, from my personal experience, um, I can't tell you the number of times that people have learned about the work that we've done all these years and then accused me of having no ambition like I'm supposed to have ambition. It's like where where was that? Right. I missed I missed that day. What what yeah. did it 
no ambition what that mean what do you what do because i because i could have turned this into the the largest human development tool to ever appear on planet earth and all that kind of stuff why didn't i go do that you could have done that you don't have any ambition you don't you don't take the initiative you don't have uh whatever that hunger is for blah 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 and i'm kind of thinking like i feel perfectly fine with that yeah, yeah. but see, that's a totally different thing than hard work well, I, I would agree because I have worked hard. It's not about hard work. That's that's about control. I mean, that's yeah. about controlling the environment and future orientation. So yeah. it's that's ambition is a whole different thing, which is another kind of value that's permeated us for many years. Right, 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 right. But that was well, it. And, and 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 when my division was shut down after 9-11, like two days after 9-11. I came to California and got into acting. Well, there you what go. What do all of my executive buddies think about that? Right? Yeah, They're envious right. as hell, but they don't know what it's right. taken to, to do it. Yep. But the but point is that I believe that this value is still present because the judgment is still present. Mm. So as we're evaluating one another, uh, you know, or uh, our generation evaluating another generation. Um, that's what this, um, one of the things that's probably coming up is this thing about, do they have a good work ethic? You know, are they really doing all the things that could be done? You know, oh my gosh. Okay. Um, now that's what I wanted to ask earlier is, is, uh, lazy, the word lazy came up and I'm like, according to whom? Exactly right. If you guys can just chat again for a moment, I need to take this call. I'll be right back. Keep talking. Be there. I wonder how the technology will continue to shift this because um, I think it was in Forbes to one of those. I uh, said it's not going to be uncommon. You already see it now with influencers or whatever they call themselves on YouTube, that it's not going to be uncommon to find a solopreneur, uh, multimillionaire, which happens now. But now they're saying it's not going to be uncommon to find a solopreneur billionaire a lot of times when you see these images of like entrepreneurship is someone on a laptop on a beach by the lonesome like totally alone but yet they're running eight or nine businesses due to technology so they're still overwhelmed but just in, like to kathy's point in a different way yep i'm back so well, i think uh, that to, to to respond to your your question uh brian the the uh, the growth of of AI and new models of that are are certainly going to allow us to live as we want to live and do what it is we do using those tools. Uh, finding that that magic key that takes it to uh, over the top, right? Uh, somebody's going to do it, sure. Yeah. I think that I think what you're talking about, Brian, is upward mobility. You know, upward economic mobility, and I think that overrides now has come to override the value of hard work. It's like upward mobility and would and with the least amount of effort. Mm. In in and not totally, but I think people yeah. work very hard to get there. But but the notion of that you know billionaire through influence kind of concept is much more of a of a valued way to operate now without the hard work that we would normally right right so it shifts the whole like conception of yeah. work itself yes yes yeah yeah that's interesting because it seems like this value here like you know fast forward to where we are now was built on a value of like industrial revolution nine to five work hard and those kinds of things but you know, that's shifting somewhat in terms yeah. of, well, I can, you know, automate some processes that are repetitive and that kind of thing. Yeah, Brian, I think you need to go further back in history. When the first settlers came to the United States, they had to have this kind of work orientation. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how many of them didn't survive the first winter? Right. You know, these sorts of things. So I think it's always, and you think about, um, Although people came here for religious freedom, they still brought their religion with them. And back in those days, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, the specific Protestant religions uh, were very strict. 
And so, yeah, you were the, the what was it? The idle hands are the devil's playground? You know, oh, absolutely. I mean, this this notion has been around since man for, since mankind, because we've had to work. It's, I mean, that's why we're in such a new era. I mean, this is the post-industrial revolution. This is a technology revolution, yeah, which yeah. has created a huge paradigm shift in how humans think about survival and wealth and and how we spend our time so that's what that's what we're experiencing now um mm -hmm. that's so totally different i think than our history has been um you know well, most of most of mankind's history i think I, I think that i think that what you're saying is is right on the surface and at a deeper level it's the same thing we're just now the veneer is rubbed away mm -hmm. we're beginning to see the mechanisms because of the internet because of all of the technology and, and oh well, uh, that's it's true it's yeah. unfolding yeah because the unfolding. level of awareness that's readily uh, available today is well i mean you go back 200 years 150 years even 100 years ago i don't know even 50 years ago could anyone have imagined having the volume of information available to them at their finger fingertips that we have today. Yeah. So yeah. it's a very different world and that awareness is definitely part of what's driving it. So fascinating. All right. So well, we're at the top of our hour. So let me just say that next time around, informality is number 10 and directness, openness, honesty is number 11. So we'll talk a little bit about those and see how those fit in. So uh, with that, thanks everybody for joining in. Thank you. Take care. Interesting. Great week, guys. Thank you. Right. See you Thursday.